Alrighty gang, today we're going to talk about predicates and quantifiers. But before we actually get to that, let's pick up on one of the things we'd left off with on Friday, the idea of turning propositional logical statements into circuits. So suppose we have the setup as follows. We've got a pair of circuits on the left-hand side, A and B, a pair of switches, and those switches can either be turned on or off, they're up or down. And then over here we've got a light bulb, and the light bulb will only go on when switches A and B are in the same position. So they both have to be up or they both have to be down. Let's see if we can turn this into a circuit who encodes the propositional logical statement on the right. So I'm going to need some sentences to work with. So let's let A be the statement that switch A is in the up position. So true means it's up, false means it's down. And let's let B be the statement that switch B is in the up position. So again, true is up, false is down. So the statement on the right, the light bulb statement, is essentially the statement that either A and B have to both be up or A and B have to both be down, which we could write as A and B or not A and not B. So a disjunction between two different conjunctions. So that's the sentence that says they're both up or they're both down. So let's translate that into a circuit. And we'll do it by kind of focusing on individual pieces. So the first thing I'm going to do is focus on the left-hand part of that disjunction. So we'll start by making a pair of circuit lines labeled A and B, and I'm going to move them close together because I know I want to put them through an AND gate, and that will get me A and B. Now to focus on the other part, I'm going to need a separate A and B line. A lot of times we draw that by, disc, or by drawing a point and moving the circuit off, and we use this little semicircular hump to denote that we're popping over uh, and not crossing through a previous line on the circuit. So now I've got an extra A and B line here. So the first thing I've got to do is I've got to go and negate those. So I will run those through an inverter on each line. Now I have not A and not B. And then I want to do the conjunction, so I'll run them through an AND gate. So now I have two lines coming out of this, A and B, or not A and not B. And so the end of the statement is to put those through a disjunction, run them through an OR gate. So that's the one that kind of looks like a Star Trek symbol turned sideways. And the resulting circuit that we've got here does the job of translating our propositional logical statement into a digital circuit diagram. Now, let's change this a little bit. What happens if the light goes on only when the switches A and B are in opposite positions? So A has to be up and B has to be down, or A has to be down and B has to be up. Well, the propositional logic statement there is just an exclusive OR. A has to be up, exclusive OR B has to be up. Unfortunately, there's no exclusive OR gate in digital circuit theory, so we're going to have to break this down in terms of our more basic terms, nots, ands, and ors. We showed in class that A exclusive OR B is logically equivalent to the statement A OR B, but not A and B. So one of the two have to be true, but they can't both be true simultaneously. And so we could turn this propositional logic right here into a circuit. And so we'll work the same way we did before. It's a conjunction. So I'll focus on the left-hand side first. I'm going to make some circuit tracks for A and B, and I'll run them through an OR gate. Next, I've got to focus on the second part. So I'm going to make two dog legs from the circuits A and B, and run those through an AND gate. So that's A and B. And then I will negate that, put it through an inverter. So now I have not A and B on the bottom line. I have A or B on the top line. And then we can run those through another AND gate. And that gives me a resulting circuit who has the job of putting on the light when the two switches are in opposite positions. We also actually proved that the exclusive OR was logically equivalent to this statement, A and not B, or not A and B. So you might take a moment to figure out how would you build the corresponding circuit for this. It'll look different, although it will function logically the same. Did you figure it out? Because I'm going to show it to you. So you pause the thing now if you haven't figured it out. Like, seriously, do it. Just because we're not meeting in class doesn't mean I don't want you to do the work. Pause the video, draw the circuit, and now compare. Drum roll. There's my version of the circuit. Does it match yours? Is yours logically equivalent to this one? It's worth playing around. All right, so let's go and tuck this away and start talking about the next thing that we want to hit in the class. So. To talk about this next bit, I'm going to go back and focus on propositions. So 2 is an even number is a proposition. It's a declarative statement about the number 2. 
In this case, it happens to be a true proposition. Now, 3 is an even number, is another proposition. It makes a declaration about the number 3. In this case, it's a false proposition. But the sentence x is an even number is not a proposition. I can't assign a truth or falsehood value to it because the answer would depend on what x is. So this is kind of the sentence we want to focus on. Things that look like this, is it possible to turn an ambiguous statement like this into a proposition? So to do that, we're going to have to focus on some grammar parts. So the first part of a sentence like this, a not quite proposition, is the subject or a variable. The second part, what property about the subject is being declared, and that's called the predicate. So a sentence like this, in which the subject is a variable, and then there's a predicate being attached to it, is called a propositional function. It becomes a proposition once a value has been selected for its subject, but as a thing by itself, it's neither true nor false until that selection has been made. So there are lots of things that you could plug in for variables that would make the statement true. So for example, 2 and 804 and 3 to the 317th power plus 9, those are all examples of even numbers. If the last one's throwing you off, just think that it's really an odd number plus an odd number, and those are always even. And if you don't believe that sentence, we'll prove it in module 2. On the other hand, there are different values that you could plug into this propositional function that would make it false. 3, 17, Benedict Cumberbatch are all examples of things that are not even integers, even numbers. So a propositional function is simply a declarative statement whose truth value is determined once a variable subject has been decided on. So let's go and start using function notation that we're kind of used to from a math class. We're going to denote propositional functions with capital letters like P's and Q's and use function notation. So the X, the argument of that function, being the subject that you could put in. So if we declared P of X to be X is an even number, then the statement P of 2 is a proposition. It's 2 is an even number, which we said was true. And P of 3 is the statement 3 is an even number, which is false. There's no reason that you only need to have two variables. Here's a propositional function with two inputs. Q of X, Y is the sentence X equals Y plus 2. As a standalone sentence, it's neither true nor false. It depends on the values. Let's take a look at the sentence Q of 1, 3 versus the sentence Q of 3, 1. Now, the numbers in blue are the x-coordinates, so I substitute those in for the x-values, and the numbers in red are y-coordinates, so I'm going to substitute them into the y-values. So if I make that substitution, I get the following. Q of 1, 3 is the sentence 1 equals 3 plus 2, which is false because 1 is not equal to 5. On the other hand, Q of 3, 1 is the sentence 3 equals 1 plus 2, which is a proposition, and it happens to be a true statement. So we're kind of turning the language of functions into the language of language itself. Let's keep working with this. So when you've got a propositional statement like this, there's always in the back of your mind something called the universe of discourse or the domain of discourse, a collection of things that you could plug in for this value that everyone sort of agrees on while we're talking about it. So maybe for whatever reason, when we built this sentence, maybe we've all agreed that we just mean that the domain of discourse is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that those are the only things we can substitute in for x. So the question I want to pose right now is if this is our domain of discourse, we're only making statements about the first six positive integers, how would you translate this sentence? There is a number that is even. Different ways of saying the same thing in English, there exists an even number or some number is even, these three sentences mean the same thing. Now, I'm not asking if they're true or not, right? Clearly, this sentence is true. There is an even number. Four is an even number. That's a true sentence in and of itself. But P of four is the statement four is an even number, whereas the three things we've got in quotes is a little bit more nuanced than that. We're not saying any one particular number is even. Only that, in our domain of discourse, there is an even number. So how could you make that sentence, translating it from English, into propositional logic? Ponder this for a second. Maybe pause the video and think, how could you write a sentence that asks that question? 
Okay, I'm going to assume you've thought about it. Since our domain consists of only numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, then what we're really saying is that P of 1 or P of 2 or P of 3 or P of 4 or P of 5 or P of 6, at least one of those sentences is true. And that's what disjunctions do. So there, P of 1 or P of 2 or P of 3 or P of 4 or P of 5 or P of 6, that means there is an even number. Because the only way that sentence is true is if one of those sub-propositions is true. No sweat. What if we added more to our universe of discourse? What if actually I had meant that we weren't talking about the first six integers, but the first 20 positive integers? And I still want to translate, there is an even number. Well, OK, that's not that hard. I just keep adding 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 and 11. And I don't want to write all of those things down. So I tend to put those little ellipses, the dot, dot, dots, and I'll end with P of 20. So these dot dot dots right here are kind of tricky. They're an abbreviation for saying we're doing something over and over a finite number of steps, but it's a great time saver so that we don't have to write down 20 individual propositions fused together by disjunctions. But let me ratchet up the difficulty one more time. Suppose our domain of discourse wasn't the first 20 numbers, but was in fact the positive counting integers, the infinite set of counting numbers. Now how do you say there is a number that is even when the numbers you're talking about are the positive integers? Well, we could go and say, well, I've got the, this sentence right here says one of the first 20 numbers is an integer, so I can keep adding things to it. I can add p of 21 and p of 22 and just keep going. The only problem with that just keep going is there is nothing in what we've talked about that lets us do this. Our Ands and ors, our disjunctions and our conjunctions, and even our implications require a front and a back end. There's nothing in propositional logic that says you can keep doing it forever and the end result is a proposition. What you've written here is an endless run-on sentence, something that would not translate. So this is what we're really going to get to today, is the idea of making a statement about the existence of of the truth of some statement without necessarily having to list all of the possibilities, particularly if the possibilities are infinite. So what we're going to do is ax this idea and introduce a new notation, a new type of propositional statement, what's called an existential statement. This sentence, there is a number that is even, there exists an even number, some number is even, we are going to write that common semantic meaning in the following symbol upside down e, x, p of x. That symbol is read, there exists an x such that p of x is true. Let me formalize this. The existential quantifier. If p of x is a propositional function, then there exists an x such that p of x is the proposition there exists at least one x naught in the domain of discourse such that the proposition p of x naught is true. So this is the statement that some object in the things we are talking about will make a given proposition true. So let's assume that our domain of discourse is the set of real numbers for a second and take a look at three different existential statements. The first statement, there exists an x such that x squared is 3. The second, there exists an x such that x squared is negative 3. And the third, there exists an x such that x squared is less than or equal to 0. Are these true or false existential statements? So the first statement, does there exist an x in the real numbers such that x squared is 3? Well, yeah, plus or minus root 3 would get the job done. The existence of 1 is all it takes to make this existential statement true. Root 3 is a real number, and root 3 squared is 3. How about the second sentence, there exists an x such that x squared is equal to negative 3? Well, we know that squaring things and getting negatives, that's imaginary numbers. In fact, if I take any real number and square it, the result is always non-negative. And so this existential statement is false. There are no real numbers whose square is negative 3. What about the third sentence? There exists a number x such that x squared is less than or equal to 0. At first glance, you might say that this is also false based off of the previous one. But non-negative and positive are not quite the same thing. The number 0 squared is 0 and that would be less than or equal to zero. So this sentence is true. And zero happens to be the only real number who gets it done. 
So we have kind of a couple of different examples. Sometimes existential statements are true for only one value, which is sometimes called a unique existential statement. Sometimes an existential statement can be true for many values, including infinitely many. And some existential statements are just not true. What would happen if we changed the domain of discourse? Instead of talking about real numbers, I want to talk about integers. How would it change my three existential statements? Well, now the first statement would become false because root 3, or negative root 3, the only two real solutions to this problem, are irrational. No integer squares to get me 3. The second statement is also false because the square of any integer is a non-negative number. The third sentence is true because 0 squared is still 0. So changing the domain of discourse can actually change the truth value of an existential proposition. So is there any way to specify that domain in the existential statement so as to clear up ambiguity? Yeah, there are a couple of different ways to do that. If we wish to specify the domain of discourse specifically, we can write it in two different ways. So one common way is to write it as there exists x in d. So write down what the domain is you're talking about first, and then in parentheses, follow up with what the propositional statement is. So you're essentially saying that there exists an x, that x has to be in the domain of discourse, and also it has to have this property. As a result of phrasing it that way, another common way of writing it is that there exists x such that x is in the domain of discourse and p of x is true. That way, if the domain of discourse is kind of ambiguous, you can go out of your way to drive home the point that out of all of the things you might be talking about, it has to be in the domain of discourse, and then this other statement is true. So for example, there exists a real number x, such that x squared equals 3, is distinct from there exists an integer x, such that x squared is equal to 3. Between the existential quantifier, the there exists upside down e, and the parenthetical predicate that we're testing, we put in the conditions of the domain of discourse that we're restricting ourselves to. An example of the third statement might be this one. There exists x such that 1 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 3, and x squared is greater than 5. So the statement in the front part right here is me specifying a domain, a domain of discourse. I'm only talking about real numbers between 1 and 3, because that's how when I use that interval notation. And then armed with that sentence, once I've got a number between 1 and 3, then I'm going to ask whether or not any of them square to getting me a number greater than 5. This last proposition, by the way, is true. You could take the number 2.5, for example. 2.5 squared will be larger than 5. Punch it out on your calculator. Double check. Make sure I'm not lying to you. So, moving on. The symbol x in these existential statements is kind of like the symbol that you would use in an integral in calc 1. It's a dummy variable. There exists x such that p of x is the same thing as there exists y such that p of y is the same thing as there exists xi such that p of xi is true. Those are all the same sentence. So you can swap the variables around sometimes when you're trying to maybe make things a little bit more clear. One other issue that's worth talking about is what happens when an existential statement is false. What does it mean for an existential statement to be false? What does it mean for there to not exist at least one x in the domain for which the statement is true? Well, that means that for no x in the domain is p of x ever a true statement. Or said differently, for every x in the domain, p of x is false. Now, how do you say the sentence, how do you say this first part, for every x in a domain? No, again, propositional statements allow me to specify what's true for a particular value. Suppose your domain of discourse was the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, like we did at the very beginning. How would you say that for every x between 1 and 6, p of x is a false statement? Well, you could say that p of 1 is false, and p of 2 is false, and p of 3 is false. But to say something is false is to say that not that is true. So you could say not p of 1, and not p of 2, and not p of 3, and not p of 4, and not p of 5, and not p of 6. Or generally, if you have a finite domain, you could say that none of the things in that domain satisfy p by saying not p of each one of those things, and then conjoin all of them together. And this will be a finite conjunction because I said that the domain was finite. But what if it's infinite? Is there a way of talking about everything in the domain 
just like there's a way of talking about one particular thing in the domain. Is there the analog of an existential quantifier that talks about everybody? The universal quantifier is the propositional statement upside down a of x, p of x, and it's read for all x, p of x is true, or said more longhand, it's the proposition that p of x naught is true for every value of x naught in the domain of discourse. A universal quantifier is a statement that everything in the domain of discourse makes the proposition true. Now, if the domain of discourse needs to be specified, like we were doing in previous examples, we can write this down as for every x in the domain, parentheses, p of x. And so what we're saying is, if you were to pick some object, once you know it's in the domain, then you could tell me that p of x is true. We're not making a statement about things not in the domain. If that sounds like an implication, a sufficient condition telling you something, that's true. That's why the other symbol is to write it as for every x. If x is in the domain, then p of x is true, to write it as an implication. So these are ways to form a universal statement about a subset of a domain or to specify a domain in particular. So for example, let's look at a couple of these things. For all real x, x squared equals 3. That's a false statement because 1 squared is not 3. How about for every integer y, y squared is greater than or equal to 0. Well, that statement is true. Every integer is a real number. Every real number squared is not negative, And that's what being greater than or equal to 0 means. As a third example, for every xi, if xi is in the interval open 0, closed 1, then 1 over xi is greater than or equal to 1. Right? That is a universal statement on a restricted domain. We're only talking about positive real numbers who are less than or equal to 1. And if you take a positive real number and you take its reciprocal, it'll stay positive. And if you take numbers who are less than or equal to 1 and flip them around as a fraction, they become greater than or equal to 1. So this is a true statement, a true universal statement. Let's turn our attention to some other questions about universal quantifiers. For example, what does it mean for the statement for all x, p of x is true, to be false? For it to be for not all x, is p of x true? Well, semantically, that would mean that p of x has to be false for at least one particular value. There is at least one x naught in the domain of discourse that p of x is not true. p of x is false. If that sounds like an existential statement to you, there is at least one, although I don't know who it is at the very beginning, you're right. So the statement for all x, p of x is false, that's logically equivalent to saying there exists some x for which p of x is not true true. And that sentence should be a true sentence. So these, semantically speaking, are the same idea. What that also means is we can now answer the question that led us to here. What does it mean for there exists x such that p of x is true to be false? It means that for every x, p of x has to be false. And that sentence has to be true. That's a little bit of a tongue twister to say. So let's now try to take our semantic understanding of these sentences and apply them to translating English sentences into quantified propositional statements. So let's look at a problem that comes out of the book. Express each of these statements using quantifiers, then form the negation of the statement so that no negation is to the left of a quantifier. Next, express the negation in simple English. We're not going to do all of these. We're just going to focus on the first one, all dogs have fleas. But if we read through them, all dogs have fleas, there's a horse that can add, every koala can climb, no monkey can speak French, and there exists a pig that can swim and catch fish. It's clear, at least to me, that the domain of discourse here is we're talking about animals. Dogs, horses, koalas, monkeys, and pigs fit in the domain of all animals. Possibly all mammals is maybe a refined subdomain. But I'm going to use this as my domain of discourse for writing these sentences down. And now I'm going to use that to focus on all dogs have fleas. So this is a universal statement. I'm saying something is true of everything. So I'm going to try to articulate it as formally as possible as a universal statement. So for all animals x, I'm specifying my domain of discourse. All dogs have fleas would mean if you gave me some random animal, once I know it's a dog, I can conclude that it has fleas. So for every x, if x is a dog, then x has fleas. That would be my 
translation into propositional logic. Or the briefer version is, for every dog x, x has fleas. We could go a little further and write c of x is the statement that x is a dog, and f of x is the statement that x has fleas, and write this as, for all x, c of x implies f of x. But I'm not going to go and do that bit right here. What I do want to focus on is, how do you put the negation of this here? The sentence, not all dogs have fleas. Well, if not all dogs have fleas, that means there's at least one dog who doesn't have one, and that's an existential statement. So there is an animal such that it is a dog, and it does not have fleas. Remember, my d domain of discourse is the set of all animals, so I'm going to talk about animals. I'm going to specify out of the many kinds of animals, it's a dog. And then I'm going to say the thing that makes it special, it not having fleas. So to translate this into propositional statement, there exists X in the domain of discourse, such that X is a dog, and it is not the case that X has fleas. You can also abbreviate Ate this to there exists a dog X such that it is not the case that X has fleas. That would certainly be clunky English, but it would be logically fine. Maybe the easiest way to say this is that some dogs don't have fleas. So let's take a look at another collection of English sentences that are more mathematically related. Every multiple of 4 is evenly divisible by 7, and there is a multiple of 4 evenly divisible by 7. I have an extra is in that second sentence. Sorry about that. So the first sentence, every multiple of 4 is evenly divisible by 7. Well, just put your multiples of 4, 4, 8, 12, 16. Those numbers aren't divisible by 17, and so this statement is false. I can give you lots of counterexamples, things that are in the domain of discourse, multiples of 4, for which the statement is not true. Now the second sentence, there is a multiple of 4 that is evenly divisible by 17. Well, if I were to go through the list of all of these numbers, maybe I'd find it, but actually if you take a step back and think about it, 4 times 17 is a multiple of 4. And it's also a multiple of 17. So whatever that number is, it works. Done. Um, an easier example, 0 also works. 0 is divisible by 17. 0 divided by 17 is 0. So this is a true statement, and I've been able to give you at least two examples of the truth of the second existential statement. But let me modify that second statement to another universal statement. Every odd multiple of 4 is evenly divisible by 17. Take a moment to think about this. Pause the video for a second and try to figure out whether or not you think this statement is true. All right, you have your answer? If we make the list of multiples of 4, we get 0, plus or minus 4, plus or minus 8, plus or minus 12, plus or minus 20. Every multiple of 4 is 4 times something, which means it's 2 times 2 times something, which means it's 2 times something, which means it's even. There are no, there are no odd multiples of 4. So what do you do with a universal statement for which the domain of discourse is empty? Every odd multiple of 4 is evenly divisible by 17, but there are no odd multiples. Is this a true or false statement? Well, it's kind of hard to get your fingers on whether it's a true statement. It's actually much easier to answer whether or not it's a false statement. For this statement to be false, we would have to find an odd multiple of 4 that is not divisible by 17. Right? The only way this is false is to give me an example of something odd multiple of 4 and not evenly divisible by 17. But since you cannot find me an odd multiple of 4, there is no number who is an odd multiple of 4 not divisible by 17. There are no counterexamples. In some sense, we win by technicality. This statement is true because there are no examples who make it false. We win by technicality. Now, if that doesn't make you feel warm and fuzzy, let me give you a second argument for why this statement is true based off of the other symbol set we use when we have a domain of discourse in mind. We could translate this sentence into propositional logic as, for every odd multiple of 4, x, x is divisible by 17. That's the shorthand version, but remember I gave you two different statements of the shorthand version, and the other one for a universal proposition is, for every x, if x is an odd multiple of 4, then x is divisible by 17. Written as an implication, one of the things we know about implications are, if the premise of an implication, the sufficient part, is false, 
the implication itself is defined to be true, right? Implications are only false when the premise is true, but the consequence is false. And so that's another argument for saying this statement is true. Universal propositions with empty domains of discourse are automatically true. So we've been talking an awful lot about statements and their negations. And so I want to summarize those two results in a quick, easy table for you. To negate a universal or an existential quantifier, you use the other kind of quantifier and negate the predicate. So to negate the statement, there exists x such that p of x is true, you make that the statement for every x. It is not the case that p of x is true. And to negate the statement for every x, p of x is true, that's equivalent to saying there exists some x for which p of x is not true. Since existential statements are essentially generalized disjunctions and universal statements are essentially generalized conjunctions, I'm taking a disjunction and turning it into a conjunction, and I'm negating a conjunction and turning it into a disjunction. Those sound and feel like the De Morgan's laws, and so these things are themselves called the De Morgan's laws for quantifiers. Now, I guess there's one little thing in here that I should probably point out. It's subtle, but what does it actually mean for two quantified predicate statements to be equivalent? When we had simple logical statements, I was saying that meant that you would get the same truth tables. But here, I don't have truth tables, and I might not even know what a truth table means because the domain of discourse might be infinite. I'd never be able to write the table down. So to say that two propositional quantified statements are equivalent means for any propositional function P you pick, and for any domain of discourse you might choose to talk about, the two statements have the same truth value. So this isn't a truth table statement. This almost sounds impossible to do. How can you consider every possible propositional function and every possible domain of discourse? Can mere mortals even do this? Huh? Let's find out. Let's try to check if this is a logical equivalence. For every x, p of x and q of x is equivalent to for every y, p of y, and for every z, q of z. The right-hand side might be a little bit ambiguous, but quantifiers always have higher precedence. So there's really invisible parentheses around this piece and invisible parentheses around that piece. And apparently I have an extra parenthesis over there, which I can't figure out how to get rid of at this stage. So sorry about that. So are these two statements, the one on the left-hand side and the one on the right-hand side, logically equivalent? To do that, we'd have to just say, all right, let's pretend that P and Q are some predicate functions. I have no idea what they are. Maybe they're statements about evenness and oddness. Maybe they're statements about being able to read or having fleas. But I've got two predicate statements. They might even be the same one. And let's pretend that I've got some domain of discourse for which I take objects from that domain and I stick them into these two sentences. I have to show that without knowing what P and Q and D are, the left-hand side and the right-hand side will always have the same value. So how can you do this? Well. The left-hand side is either a true statement or a false statement because it's assumed to be a proposition. So I'm going to check if the left-hand side is true, that the right-hand side is true. And if the left-hand side is false, the right-hand side is false. That's the, how I can check that those two things have the same propositional value. So let's pretend that the left-hand side is true. Will the right-hand side be true too? So the left-hand side is this statement. For every x, both p of x and q of x are true. So that means for any value in the domain of discourse, and I'm going to use the letter T just to remind you that X is not special. It's a dummy variable. For any element in the domain of discourse T, the sentence P of T and Q of T is true. But that means that both P of T and Q of T are true individually. So for any object in the domain of discourse, P of T and Q of T are both true individually. So let me focus on half of that sentence. If I focus on the P bit, for every t, an object in the domain of discourse, I know that p of t is true. That's what for every y, p of y means. So for every y, p of y is a true statement. And similarly, we know from this line that for every t in d, q of t is also true. That means for every z, q of z is true, is a true statement. But since for every y, p of y, and for every z, q of z are true statements, their conjunction is true. So if the left-hand side is true, then the right-hand side is true as well. Cool. So if the left-hand side is true, the right-hand side is true. What about if the left-hand side is false? Will the right-hand side be false as well? Let's check it out. 
let's suppose the left-hand side is now false. That is, the statement for every x, p of x and q of x is false. That means that there is some c in the domain of discourse where the statement p of c and q of c is a false statement. And I'm using the letter c because it's a counterexample, a statement that shows that something universal is not universal. Since p of c and q of c is false, that means that p of c is false, or q of c is false, or possibly both. If p of c is false, that is, if this element c in the domain of discourse makes p of c a false statement, then the statement for every y p of y is also false, because clearly p of y is not always true. The value c is a counterexample. But that would mean for every y p of y and for every z q of z is a false statement, because disjoining the false statement is false. On the other hand, if q of c is false, then we know that the sentence for every z q of z is false because the value c is a counterexample. But again, that's going to make the right-hand side false. If the left-hand side is false, then either for every y p of y or for every z q of z is a false statement. But when I conjoin them together, the right-hand side will be false. So the upshot is, is it true that these two things are logically equivalent? The answer is yeah. This is a logical equivalence. Let's do one more example, but I'm going to turn all of the universal quantifiers into existential ones. So now we want to see whether the sentence there exists an x such that p of x and q of x is true is logically equivalent to the conjoined statement there exists y such that p of y is true and there exists z such that q of z is true. So we can start out like we did last time. Let's pretend that p and q are predicate functions, and d is their common domain of discourse, even though I have no idea what any of those things are. We have to show that the left-hand side is true if and only if the right-hand side is true. So let's pretend that the left-hand side is true, that there exists a value in the domain of discourse such that p of x and q of x are both true. So there's some subject, some object, some thing, epsilon naught, in the domain of discourse with p of epsilon naught and q of epsilon naught being true. That means both p of epsilon naught and q of epsilon naught are true individually. But since p of epsilon naught is true, that means the sentence there exists a y such that p of y is a true sentence because I have an example, epsilon naught. And because q of epsilon naught is true individually, that means the sentence there exists a z such that q of z is true. And so since both of the conjoined pieces are true, the conjunction there exists y such that p of y and there exists q such that, sorry, there exists z such that q of z is true, is a true sentence. Boom, we are in the home stretch. Now let's say that the left-hand side is false. So if the left-hand side, the statement there exists an x such that p of x and q of x holds, is a false statement, that means that for no object in the domain of discourse is p of t and q of t ever true. That is, for any point you pick in D, for any object of conversation, of discourse, at least one of the two propositions, P of T or Q of T, is false. They might both be false, but you know at least one of them has to be false. Is that the same thing as saying that the right-hand side of the sentence is false? Well, let's break it down. The statement, there exists Y such that P of Y, being false would mean that p of t is always false for any specific object you talk about. There would be no value for which p of y is true. But the sentence p of t is always false is not quite the same thing as the sentence above here, which is that at least one of p of t or q of t is always false. And similarly, the statement there exists z such that q of z being false would say that q of z is never ever true. But that's not what we know. What we know is that p of t and q of t are never true simultaneously. So that would suggest that these two statements, the one on the left and the one on the right, aren't equivalent. But that's not enough. Just because it doesn't sound like they match up doesn't prove that it, they don't actually match up. Since we're trying to show that these two statements always match, that's a universal statement. To show that they don't match, we have to find a counterexample. Is there a domain of discourse and two predicates for which we could capitalize on the fact that we don't feel that these two things match up? 
why don't you take a moment and see if you could come up with something that exploits this dichotomy. Could you find a domain of discourse and two different predicates so that the left-hand side and the right-hand side have different truth values? And again, I'm going to pause the video for a second and let you kind of ponder your way through. Were you able to come up with an example? I'm going to show you one, and I want to point out it's not the only one that's out there, but I'm striving for simplicity. I want it to be as kind of low-key as possible. So for my domain of discourse, it's going to be the universe of bits, the number 0 or 1. So my domain of discourse has two objects in it. And my two propositional sentences are going to be P of X is the statement X equals 0, and Q of X is the statement X equals 1. So, for example, P of 0 is true, P of 1 is false, Q of 0 is false, and Q of 1 is true. So I've got a little bit of flexibility there. Let's focus on the left-hand side. The sentence, there exists X such that P of X and Q of X, that translates to, there exists a bit X in my domain of discourse, such that X is equal to 0 and X is equal to 1 simultaneously. But clearly that can't be true because to be equal to 0 and equal to 1 is the same thing as saying that 0 and 1 are the same thing. So we know that this statement is false. You cannot be both 0 and 1 simultaneously. So here is a domain of discourse and a set of predicates for which the left-hand side is false. I'm going to make the claim that the right-hand side is true. Take the right-hand side. The statement there exists y such that p of y translates in this scenario to there exists a bit y such that y is equal to 0. And that statement is true, because I can take y to be 0. The bit 0 is 0. Neat. And similarly, the statement there exists z such that q of z is the statement there exists a b such that z is equal to 1. And that statement is true, because 1 is a bit. So since there exists y such that p of y and there exists z such that q of z are both true statements, their conjunction is true. So for this domain of discourse with these two predicates, the left-hand side and the right-hand sides do not match. Are these statements logically equivalent? No. So I'm going to call it quits right here and have you take a look at the problems that come out of section 1.4. Uh, existential and universal quantifiers are kind of a trippy, trippy, well, they're that too, but they're kind of a tricky topic. So go through the problems on section 1.4 and send me email. Let me know what things you're still struggling with so that I can figure out what we're going to do on Wednesday because it's likely I won't be able to get back to class on Wednesday either. Spoilers. Alrighty, I will talk to you later.